Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. The combination of a looming union-wide general election, the 2024 Welsh Labour leadership election, and the publication of the Independent Commission of the Constitutional Future of Wales have created the conditions for widespread debate on the future of the justice system in Wales. Famously an outlier in the UK Union, Wales is the only nation without control of its own justice system, leading to the ongoing and somewhat confusing use of England and Wales to describe a single territory or extent rather than two separate ones. Why is this the case? And why has it proved to be such a determining factor in the development of Welsh devolution? The current operation of the Senedd's competencies and division between members of the UK Parliament and members of the Senedd about the future direction of Wales. To discuss, we are joined by Professor Emir Lewis, Head of Department of Law and Criminology at Aberystwyth University. Hello, Emir. Hello. And Dr. Cathy Hampson, also of the Department of Law and Criminology at Aberystwyth University. Hello, Cathy. Hello. Thanks very much both for joining us. This is a huge subject um, that we have ahead of us and we're going to need to cover quite a lot of ground. But I think there's probably a need to sort of set the scene a little bit at the top. Can you outline to us, you know, in the in the broadest possible sense, Emir, um, a little bit about the landscape of the present UK in terms of law and justice? In broad strokes, what is the sort of patchwork of justice functions and jurisdictions that currently operate? And where are the centres of power? So, in formal terms, the United Kingdom has got three territories which, are, which have their own legal jurisdiction. So, one of them is Scotland, another one is Northern Ireland, and the other one is England and Wales. So, England and Wales are a single territory from the point of view of the administration of justice. All of those jurisdictions have their own courts, their own appeal courts, and the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom acts as an ultimate court for almost everything that happens in due course within those jurisdictions. Now, what does that mean? So in formal terms, again, each territory has got its own law. So there is a law of Scotland, there is a law of Northern Ireland, and there is a law of England and Wales, which applies within that territory. That's the formal position we're in. So in formal terms, there is no separate Wales jurisdiction. It's not a separate, legally not a territorial, a separate territory. Neither is there an England one. The governance of the system of justice lies within the, for the case of England and Wales, lies in London with the Ministry of Justice and, so far as the police are concerned, the, the, the Home Office. Whereas in Scotland and Northern Ireland, in Scotland it, will, it is it is it's from Edinburgh, Northern Ireland, you know, crossing our fingers now, um, given what's happened this week, that'll be returned to the care of the uh, Northern Ireland Legislative Assembly. And executive. Having said that, uh, there are a number of things which are adjacent to justice, which are devolved in Wales, or and therefore, in a funny way, in England as well. Um, they are they are distinct. Um, so, for example, we have seen the Welsh ministers using certain powers they've got in order to create a tribunal system for Wales for certain, for example, mental health review tribunals where the powers are devolved or to fund community officers to support the work of the police. So that's in broad terms where we are right now. Yeah, thank you. I think that's very helpful for people like myself who have no legal background whatsoever and I find it all endlessly fascinating. The way you've described it is that the you know the UK is often described as a union of four nations, but in the legal sense, it's a union of three nations: Scotland, Northern Ireland, and England and Wales, as you as you've said. You're know, three and a bit. It depends how you look at it. I think. I know that there's an awful lot of history, and I don't want this to be a history podcast necessarily. Um, but just I wonder if you could explain for our listeners why why do we have England and Wales 
as a single unit versus England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland as separate legal entities. Yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, the starting point is history. We, you, there are many starting points, but I think the, what the conventional one would be in the 16th century, the, um, the laws in Wales Acts 1536 uh, and 1543, uh, which essentially said that um, from this point onwards, English law applies in Wales. So the law, which was the law of the realm of England, was also said, and it, this is going to apply in Wales from now on. There was no referendum, unfortunately, or anything else. It was a you know, clear power play by, by the king. And what those acts did, therefore, was to a large extent, but not completely, supplant the native or Welsh legal systems which were which were in place in formal terms. They still continued informally, and they and they could sometimes also be invoked in the in the new system. But interestingly, to go with that imposition, if you like, of English law within Wales, there was created a Welsh organ of government, if you like, the Court of Session, which was a court system, first instance court system which applied only in Wales. So peculiarly, you could speak well of Wales in those days as having its own legal system, being a legal territory in that extent, but of not having its own law because the law would be applied the same way across the whole territory. Now, that court, that system, was abolished in 1830. And since then, the system of courts is an England and Wales system of courts, it's governed from uh, as, as one system of courts. And of course, there are special circumstances in relation to Wales, which mean that you know some things happen in Wales which don't happen in England. For example, the right to use Welsh in court proceedings. But it's pretty much the same, um, because what we've started to have, of course, is a divergence between law in Wales and in England as a consequence of devolution, although it did exist before then divergence. And that's not as people imagined, because Wales was going to go around and change loads of laws. We've done a lot of that, but more because that kind of dynamism happening in England, particularly around things like, like health and local, local government, where there's changes made in England which haven't been made in Wales. So there's inertia in Wales, as well as momentum. And so we've come to the point where we've got a divergence in the laws which apply in the both in both places, um, but it is still one law. So we have one law which just applies differently in two distinct territories. So we found ourselves in a position where, wh while the law is different, and you can properly speak of a law of Wales and a law of England, the rest of the the, the pattern, the picture, has not caught up. I mean, the classic classic framing of a democratic. Um, democratic governance is that you've got you know, the three, three, um, what do we call it? Three legs of the stool. Three legged stool. Thank you very much. <laughs> Richard Wynne Jones and R Rob Jones of the Wales Governance Centre have uh, written a really uh, stirring book, which starts with describing the three legged stool, which goes back to theorists of the separation of powers way back, way back when Aristotle, um, if you want to go way back. In any event, the idea is that you've got someone who makes the laws, the legislature, the, which in the Welsh case would be the Senedd. You've got the uh, executive, the government, which does things which governs, which is in the Welsh case, the Welsh government. And then you've got the courts. And Wales is missing, some people would argue, that third leg of the stool. And you know what happens when a stool's only got two legs, it falls over. Depends how good you are at balancing. Uh, mm -hmm. humbly. It depends how good <laughs> yes, you are indeed. at balancing. Yeah, 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 you can. I think, I think perhaps we um, should um, give Welsh politicians more, and certainly civil servants, more credit than they usually get for their ability to balance on that still. Yeah. Excellent. I'm all for, uh, I come from a family of civil servants, so I'm all okay. for praising civil servants. If I can be a little bit uh, even further frivolous than I have been, I, uh, I have heard it suggested that England and Wales nomenclature um, is essentially an error, and, and that when those acts of, well, I can't remember what the official name is, the acts of union as they're informally known in Wales, yeah. essentially should have described the law as simply being English law instead of the law of England and Wales. And 
Um, is that not fair? I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yes, I, and you you will. I mean, I most of my career I've spent as a practicing lawyer. I don't know how many times I've had to take exception when negotiating contracts with people to their use of the of the word English law when they're dealing with contracts which are going to be operable in Wales. And I point out to them that it should be called the law of England and Wales. But it really, but you know, really, it's uh, that's just a label at the end of the day. I mean, it, you know, it, it 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 raises a reaction in someone like me when it's the kind of circumstance you describe. Also, it, it's it's complicated because you're talking about a time when you can't really say there were nation states existing in quite the same way as they developed during the 19th century, and um, you know it was the it was the law of the realm which was going to apply in Wales, and and actually Wales didn't come become part of England until a, a later a later date. Um, but but you know ultimately that's just that's just a phrase, uh, the description of it as as English law. It's a frequently used phrase to describe this. The fact that it comes from Westminster, the law for England and Wales, means that it's very, very centric on England and reflects the attitudes of those who are creating the law, which is, well, largely English. And so when Wales wants to do something differently and has a different attitude, that is therefore not allowed to happen because we're shackled to the English attitude. And my area of, of youth justice is a very good example of that because we have English-centric law dictating what Welsh youth justice should look like, what age we should prosecute children and, and such uh, thorny issues as that, that, that the, U, the UK government-centric on Westminster is not prepared to, to compromise on or to look at whereas the Welsh centre of government definitely wants to look at these things. So I think that there is a there is meaning in that in that English centric understanding of English brackets and Welsh law that it does operate in that way. Yeah, as I may have mentioned, this comes up in uh, Richard and Rob's book on um, the Welsh criminal justice system in that, that you know Wales is the exception because the rest of the jurisdiction behaves like England because it is, you know, English law for the, um, for the main part and the scrutiny and uh, lawmaking, you know, is always through that prism. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really interesting. I'm sure we'll circle back to youth justice, uh, Cathy, in the very near future. Um, and we're, we're barreling towards, um, I think, uh, the point of change at which we start to think more about the in inverted commas Welsh justice system as a sort of standalone thing in the era of devolution. But I do just want to flag, Emir mentioned there, the, the, the sort of realm nature of the history there. I just want to put a pin in this. I mentioned this to Emir when we were talking about planning this podcast. There's a phenomenally useful uh, blog um, by Vaughan Roderick of the BBC called The Devil in the Shawl, um, which uh, does trace back. It was written at around the time of the 2016 draft Wales bill that really illustrates quite nicely that that kind of um, history to this um, this particular conundrum. Um, heading into the period of devolution, then we've, we've, we've spoken with guests in the past about how an unwieldy and arguably dysfunctional from the outset, the 1999 Welsh devolution settlement was. Um, and part, part of the explanation for that has been that unlike Scotland, for example, the, the, the devolution settlement was sort of bent around not necessarily wanting to touch questions of law and justice. And I, I, I wonder if that would be your reading too. Um, yeah, yes, it would. Can I just mention a, a, a nice paradox that arose out of the Acts of Union? It, it, was, it was the first time, actually, that, the, that Wales was defined legally as uh, in, in um, territorial terms. The territory of Wales was defined. And um, Professor Thomas Glyn Watkin, um, in his History of, <laughs> History of Welsh Law, uh, says that this was the this was actually, you know, paradoxically a positive thing from a Welsh perspective because Wales obtained for the first time a legal def definition of its political geography. Anyhow, that wasn't an going to answer your question. So what happened in 1999? The new Labour plans for devolution uh, distinguished between the proposed plans for Wales and the proposed plans for Scotland. Scotland was going to get a legislative parliament. Um, to which all powers would be devolved, apart from those which were kept back to, West, to Westminster, kept back in London. 
and they would include the administration of justice in Scotland. Because Scotland already had its own legal jurisdiction, its own court system, its own legal professions, which had remained in place, notwithstanding the Act of Union in 1707, those had remained, although being ad locally administered in Scotland, and, but legislated about in London. Wales didn't have that. And Wales was not going to get the same thing. What Wales was going to get was an administrative assembly. This, in formal terms, was a bit like a local authority, because it was a corporation which had elected members who had a committee who would move business forward. It had no powers to make acts, but it did have powers to make secondary legislation. What does that mean? That's legislation which is usually made by government ministers, where parliament gives them the power to make regulations. A great example of these is what's happened during the coronavirus pandemic. Parliament had given ministers the powers to make laws so that they could quickly flex the law in terms of when you were allowed to stay in and when you weren't were not allowed to stay in, for example, or obliged to stay in. Rather. So before the assembly was set up, a lot of these powers, um, executive powers to govern in Wales, and also these lawmaking powers, secondary lawmaking powers, belong to the Secretary of State for Wales. So what happened on devolution was, and this is one of the big arguments for devolution is, we're going to democratize this. Rather than that there should be a Secretary of State for Wales based in London, who, uh, who is essentially a Westminster politician in the governing party of the time, which may well not have been the party which garnered the majority of votes in Wales, we would pass that person's powers to an elected body in Wales. So it's a very different conception of devolution in Wales from the conception of devolution in the first place. It was simply democratizing the executive powers of the um, Secretary of State. The powers to make primary legislation for Wales remained in London. And one of the justifications for this was, well, Wales does not have its own legal jurisdiction, unlike Scotland. There were others as well, but that was the primary one. Because Wales doesn't have a, a legal jurisdiction, because it's not like Scotland, it's going to have something different. So, Cathy, I wonder if we can bring you in here. I mean, your expertise is in the area of youth justice, and youth justice is one of those things that has been, you know, in terms of aspects of law, has been directly at the heart of policymaking in Wales. Um, think about um, many of the immediate and adjacent policy areas that Welsh Government have been interested in since inception. So, as a prism through which we can see this kind of wider issue about justice in Wales, how would you characterise the beginnings of that era of devolution through the prism of youth justice? Problematic, I think, really, because um, we started off from a position in 1999 where there was a, a new youth justice system being created in England through the Crime Disorder Act in 1998 which created these new uh, bodies called youth offending teams, which had oversight of, of delivering justice to children. And they were made up of, they were multi-agency teams made up of um, probation, police, education, health and social services. So we have in that little group of, of, um, of agencies, three that are then devolved, and two which are not, police and probation not, but health, education and social services are. So we've created automatically through that process um, something which pulls against itself in terms of, uh, of where policy comes from, strategy, how that works. Uh, and so it started off from a point where I think you would say you don't want to start from this point. It, it's, not a, it's not a helpful beginning. And from the start, Wales wanted to do youth justice differently to England. And that was really begun by Mark Drakeford, to be honest, when he was an academic in 1998. He wrote, wrote a book um, which uh, said we need to treat children as children first, offenders second. And that 
phrase was picked up by youth justice in Wales and saying this is what we want to do this is we want to 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 look at children as children and see their needs and difficulties and address what's going on for those children rather than looking at them as an offender and being punitive and risk driven and negative which was where England was really taking things so we wanted to do things very different but of course being bound to England we were bound to the new system which was very much offender first child second which again created something which was pulling against itself and so as soon as Wales started to get a little bit of of a crack of independence, if you like, they started to be able to create at least internal policy that would start to put into place something that was a bit more child first, offender second. And we had in 2004 the first policy which actually put that in writing and stated this is how youth justice is going to work in Wales, which was the uh, All Wales Youth Offending uh, Plan. So that was the first time this actually uh, was on paper, if you like, something that was bifurcating from England um, and doing something that was very, very different. So that doesn't sound great, um, if I'm being honest with you. Um, Obviously, whilst whilst devolution has changed incredibly rapidly um, over its 25 years or so, the first major revision um, to Wel- the Welsh Devolution Settlement came in 2006 with the Government of Wales Act, which sort of introduced a somewhat Byzantine manner, which the Senate or the Assembly, as was then, uh, could make law. Did that affect youth justice in any considerable way? Not in terms of the legal background, because the legal background very much stayed the same, except, of course, there were... Um, laws started to come into place regarding education and social services and health that then sort of pulled that bit towards a Welsh-centric approach. So again, we got this pulling against each other in terms of where that legislation comes from. But we did see through that the first decade of the, the 21st century, if you like, th- a greater gap opening up between England and Wales and how they were delivering youth justice in terms of the fact that there was the youth justice board which oversees uh, youth justice in England and Wales actually set up what they called the the youth justice board Cymru who had um, the ability to create policy for for Welsh youth justice and it was allowed to be different and so um, that that developed um, various aspects that that were quite different to England uh, so we've got the uh, Swansea Bureau which then w- uh, is is a way of of um children who are just at the very beginning of of starting to perhaps do something that could be they could be arrested for or, uh, and rather than taking them to court they're taken to a bureau uh, which uh, looks at a plan to try and help them looks at non-criminalizing outcomes it's trying to keep children out of the system uh, Wales was ahead of the game where England, in compared to England with that, because England started to do something called triage, which actually didn't particularly decriminalise and stop that criminalisation of children, just sort of did it in a different way. There was a non-criminal uh, disposal, which you could get in Wales, which you couldn't get in England. So it started to have different outcomes for children, depending on whether they were in Wales or in England. And that sort of developed through that first decade uh, to really bring, I suppose, a bit more reality to the child first, offender second rhetoric that was part of the the policy in Wales. Yeah, as, as someone with no legal training, some of the terminology used in these circumstances is um, is pretty uh, is pretty bleak. I, I don't particularly like the sound of disposal. Uh, if I'm being entirely <laughs> honest with you, uh, um, em, em, Emir, uh, the, the legacy of of 2006 Wales Act is still with us quite considerably to this day. What was the sort of broader picture around that period and that piece of legislation, because it did bring in some huge changes um, to the Welsh settlement. The political background, I think, can be explained by the fact the genie was out of the bottle. And once you have set up an all Wales body, which you think of as being the, the, the governance of Wales, but it's like a local authority, it isn't right. So there was a, the, the momentum of politics, effectively, 
meant that they set up, to all intents and purposes, a separate legislature and executive within the um, uh, within the assembly, uh, and with, and the civil service indeed broke into two. One being called the the assembly democratic. Uh, service, I think it was kind of the precise name of it, but these were looking after the AMs, if you like, the assembly members, with the rest of the civil service doing an executive job. And then the, you know, the, the 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 statutory name for what we now call first minister was first secretary, um, but the politicians just decided, oh, we're going to ditch these, we're going to call ourselves ministers, and you know th that was almost an unstoppable momentum for Wales actually to have two legs instead of one leg on its stool, and to have a set distinct legislature and executive. But um, it happened in a very, in a rather begrudging way. The Government of Wales Act 2006 actually created what, what is by now the Senate and the Welsh Government as two distinct organs of government instead of the one corporate body as they were before. The powers given to legislate were really weird. These were a schedule in the Government of Wales Act 2006, which is almost blank. And in order to fill that schedule with powers to legislate on specific things, either the Queen um, would have to order a transfer through a, 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 an order in council, or the, um, in, and in order for that to, or, or legislation would need to be passed in Westminster. Um, in either case, it involved a really painful tussle between Cardiff and, interestingly, the Welsh MPs about whether or not powers should be devolved. So in Cardiff, for example, they asked for powers over the environment. So they went to London. The Welsh um, Affairs Select Committee wanted, how are you going to use these powers? And eventually they ended up as being the power to ban plastic bags or to charge for plastic bags. You know, I mean, starting with the environment, you end up with that. And it was a, a real micromanagement. And these things took time. They couldn't make it, they couldn't pass a single piece of legislation in the first three years of the four-year terms of the of the assembly. They eventually passed the Welsh language measure, um, the children's children, young, children rights of person, children and young persons measure, which is actually quite important, at least conceptually from a youth justice perspective. So that's what happened. Why? Why was the, why was this micromanagement in place? So and I should also say there was then a, 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 the ability to have a referendum, which eventually happened in 2011, to fill in, in broad terms to fill all these blank spaces. So Wales got a whole dose of legislative power following the uh, successful referendum in 2011. But why why was it like this? Remember, in Scotland, they could legislate about anything unless it was reserved to the centre. For example, the monarchy or immigration or the armed forces. In Wales, you were getting bits now and then, okay? And suddenly you've got a big lump, but you still didn't get everything. So why do it like that? And there's an interesting memorandum which um, Padre Morgan and Peter Hayne had presented uh, in 2006, saying, if the Assembly had the same general power to legislate as the Scottish Parliament, then the consequences for the unity of the England and Wales legal jurisdiction would be considerable. I'll go on about that in a bit more detail, but to pause at this point, right? So we see that it is more important to preserve the unity of the single England and Wales jurisdiction than it is to have a settlement for Wales that's like Scotland. So that England and Wales jurisdiction is being and has been privileged as a concept, as a phenomenon within the governance of Wales. And that trumping of other considerations by the need to preserve the unity of the jurisdiction has gone on to inform the different, the, not only the 2006 Act, but the discussions about what would come later, and indeed the 2017 Act, which did give Wales the same type of settlement as Scotland, but it reserved to Westminster all powers relating, almost all powers relating to justice and the courts, the administration of justice, police, etc. Cathy, Emir mentioned the 2011 referendum there. In terms of your particular area of expertise, when Wales supported that vote, the people of Wales um, supported in a referendum in 2011 by, I think, almost two to one, if memory serves correctly, in terms of those who voted um, uh, to give 
Wales' primary lawmaking powers. What was the impact from a youth justice point of view, if, if any of that? I get, well, immediately, in terms of the children's rights measure in 2011, was um, an important marker of the attitude, I think, towards children, which is very different to England, that the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child should be a, a consideration in the in the production of any policy or legislation relating to children. And that there then has influenced everything going forward from that point. So in 2014, we get the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, which, of course, then changes a lot of the way that social services works with children um, and the uh, well-being of uh, Future Generations Act the year after, both of which I think are significantly impacted by that children's rights measure. Particularly, you can see it in terms of the importance of collaboration. And so children must be consulted, must be drawn into collaboration to co-produce policy and, and and things that are affecting them, which you won't see featuring in any English-centric uh, legislation in the same way at all. So it's I think that going forward, you can see quite a quite a big gulf opening up in terms of those areas that are legislated from Cardiff and those areas that are legislated from Westminster. And and that that 2011 referendum changed an awful lot of things. Of course, it came as a result of the One Wales Agreement, the coalition between Ply Cymru and um, whilst Labour, um, between uh, government uh, lead led by uh, Rhodri Morgan and Ian Wynne jones um, But it did change the the landscape somewhat, not only because of the, the changes it latterly brought in law, but also I think it also reaffirmed or accentuated the support for devolution and kind of gave it a greater degree of confidence going into its second full decade. What's your what's your uh, view on that period, Emir, and what the changes that followed from that referendum are? Um, I think in terms of the, our, our topic of discussion, I think it started the ball rolling on thinking seriously about the devolution of justice to Wales. The, the problem from uh, another part of the um, Rodri Morgan and um, Peter Hay memorandum said... Um, would be um, if if we did have the Scottish system, the courts would, as time went by, be increasingly called upon to apply fundamentally different basic principles of law and rules of law of general application, which were different in Wales from those which applied in England. The consequence, the practical consequences, would be the need for different systems and so on. Right, but the point was the genie was out of the bottle. Another genie was out of the bottle. The genie this time was that the Welsh Assembly, as it was could change the law. It was capable of passing um, acts which were capable of amending acts of parliament as they applied in Wales and of making new law for Wales. And, you know, there were, there are some fantastic examples of groundbreaking legislation. The, the legislation around, for example, the organ transplantation, enormously complex, very, very um, deep issues of ethics and morals. And cross jurisdiction, cross border, we can't say cross jurisdiction, cross border issues between Wales and England, which were handled expertly by the civil service in Cardiff and by the politicians. There, there was stuff like that which, which happened, which I think plays to your argument about self-confidence or emboldening. But it also, I think, raised the question, well, what is it that is so sacrosanct actually about this England and Wales legal territory and this England and Wales law? And we had, of course, we had the various commissions. We had the Silk Commission, which uh, recommended in due course the devolution of, of justice. But, but perhaps the most significant change was the change in the attitude of the Welsh government itself. Whereas in response to Silk, it said, yes, we sort of agree that should happen. We don't see the need for it now, though. Right? Within a few years of Carwin Jones's um, premiership, they were drafting a bill whose purpose was to establish a distinct Welsh law, interestingly, keeping the court systems as one system, but that the judges would sit as Welsh judges in Wales and English judges in England. And with a 10-year sort of sunset um, by which all of justice would be devolved to Wales. And that was put forward by the Welsh government at a time of 
interesting discussions that were taking place. So I think that sea change in Welsh government view was significant. Unfortunately, of course, it coexisted with a government in London that was not at all sympathetic to the idea of create, although to be fair to that government in London, it was the government that, that gave us a Scotland style um, settlement, but that was for some, I won't go into the de- reasons why, but th- th- suffice it to say it was not altruism. So, so you had this momentum within Wales, but I think probably a hardening resistance uh, in Westminster. I'm wondering if what you're alluding to about the, one of the reasons why the change of heart and from Westminster was about court challenges to yes. the Supreme Court. Is that correct? Yes, where, yes. yes. Uh, where, where, where what were once known as silent subjects had been found to be somewhat more quite. Um, exploitable quite. at yes. one end of the M4 than quite. the other end of the M4 had anticipated. That's quite a so. podcast Absolutely. for another time. Um, um, I think if, I, if memory serves correctly, um, the um, legislation that you mentioned that Carwin Jones and his team drew up was called the Alternative Wales Bill. Yeah, it, it, it is known as that, shall we say. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. Um, and, and of course, at the time, there was uh, a draft Wales bill, um, at, mm. uh, around which time this same question of, mm. um, uh, among many others, of justice, jurisdiction and you know, policing and various other functions had been discussed. And I you know, uh, have a personal memory of you talking about this at, uh, at, on a podcast at the time. Um, could you just outline what was the what was the, the tension there? Um, in this kind of arc of improvements in inverted commas to the Welsh devolution settlement, and what was why was this tension there, and why did Carwin Jones get his civil service team, his legal team, to draft that piece of legislation, which was quite odd when you think about it. It was a Welsh government drafting a piece of government uh, legislation that was a template for a UK government to enact. Yes. A cat may look as, at a king, as my mother used to say. I mean, you know, why, 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 why shouldn't they? But um, the draft Wales bill uh, is, I'm glad to say, a, a forgotten piece of of, um, of of draft legislation. It was uh, not it was, in these parts, ve- Emir. It's still very, <laughs> very fondly remembered it's here. Still, it still smart. <laughs> it's a. It was a very strange document, uh, which was part of a process involving the Secretary of State for Wales and his shadow counterpart. But I think to cut a long story short, it contained such restrictions designed to protect the law of England and Wales and the single jurisdiction of England and Wales, that it would have been virtually impossible for the assembly as it was then in Cardiff to legislate about anything at all, because it would have had always to go cap in hand to London to ask for an exception. It was around the criminal law, around civil law. They were so all-embracing, it would have completely stopped uh, Welsh democracy in its tracks. And my, I don't think it's. I don't think it's overstating that. Gr- brush up the old podcast to see what I said then. I probably still think the same. Yeah. It is still available. I will put a link in the show notes, and go. and also I will also plug the uh, a pod that will arrive in this feed in the near future, where we spoke to a number of the politicians involved in the room uh, that drew up um, those proposals uh, for the Draft Wales Act. And there's, um, yes, it's quite illuminating. I, I will leave it at that as a tease. <laughs> but of course, what, what we then had was the 2017. Ultimately, that was, uh, there was a, a significant revision done by then a Secretary of State for Wales, uh, Stephen Crabb. Um, it went well, went back to the drawing board to a certain degree, and ultimately we then had the 2017 Wales Act, which is the last, or most recent major um, dev- uh, adjustment to the devolution setup in in Wales. Still no new youth justice powers, uh, Cathy. Um, at this point, um, what is the situation in Wales, and and um, not just I suppose in youth justice, but in other associated areas, um, is this? continuing to be a problem as that divergence that you described earlier is continuing? I think Wales is quite liking the divergence and the the ability to just shuffle a little bit away from what Westminster was doing and what the London-centric, really, Youth Justice Board was doing. So this divergence was continuing. Wales were quite happy with that. England, in a sense, was OK with it because England had started to see different parts of of England as a as 
perhaps looking looking at different ways of doing things. So, for example, Greater Manchester might be doing things differently to London, to Birmingham, and seeing the possibility of actually sort of breaking up the the overarching approach of of one sort of organisation dictating to everyone else how it should happen. So I think the Youth Justice Board Cymru got a lot more um, wiggle room, shall we say, without it actually being kind of legislatively different, was able to uh, create some quite different uh, approaches on the ground, which I think is, is, is very interesting. And one of the most interesting things is probably um, the fact that Having developed this child first offender second approach to drive to youth justice, the YJB England started to look at this and to say, actually, we quite like this. And now they have made that the policy for the whole jurisdiction of England and Wales. So having started off in Wales, it's now become something that England has sort of snaffled as a as a as a as a whole approach. I think demonstrating um a, a, an important principle that Wales is actually very capable of doing justice because it's come up with approaches that England has then said Hmm, actually, we like this and we'll take this as well. Um, so the arguments that I've, the ones that I've tended to hear against further devolution is, oh, you know, we don't think Wales is capable of doing that. Well, I would beg to differ. This shows that uh, Wales is has actually done better than England because England has decided, yes, we want to adopt that as well. So that's, I think, a, a, an interesting illustration of Wales's competence in this area. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, this all takes place in the, uh, at this period of time that you're talking about there. It's, I think it's fair to say that um, the UK government was going through uh, some issues, uh, working through some issues in that post-Brexit vote period. And, uh, and not only generally across government, but also particularly in the area of justice. I remember the, um, the brief and largely inglorious tenure of Chris Grayling as uh, Justice Secretary and, and the revisions to probation system which were then undone several years later at much much cost um and so it's you know there are no, there's no not been a great deal of stability in that period um um so it's quite interesting to see uh, to hear about that that that, con that, that, that welsh aspect um Emir, if i can turn to you um one thing that anyone who studied this area in any shape or form will know about is something called the thomas commission uh, which uh if i remember correctly was ultimately the report was called Justice for Wales for the people of Wales or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about what this was and, and how it sort of builds on some of the, as you, as you quite rightly said, that sort of change in direction on this question from successive Welsh governments, sure. but also how it builds on perhaps on Silk and the Silk Commission and sure. previous commissions. So the Thomas Commission was chaired by the former Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, um, Lord John Thomas of Cwm Gieth. And he and a number of other individuals who were you know, prominent people from the field of law and the administration of justice. You have, for example, Sir Wynne Williams, who is now uh, chairing the post office inquiry. None of these were politicians. There were no politicians there. And they took a lot of evidence and a long, hard look at the way in which the, the system of justice, not just criminal justice, not just youth justice, but justice as a whole, was operating in Wales. Um, and rather than look at it through, you know, sort of the geeky lawyer's lens, which I do, which you say, well, let's have a neat system where Wales has got its own jurisdiction and, you know, it looks better and so on. They, they, they looked, first of all, at what the problems were, what the issues were, how things were working on the ground. And reflecting a bit on what Cathy was saying about the different difficulty of having joined up policy and joined up delivery, they came to the conclusion, I'll, I'll read a bit of what they said. There is a fragmented and complex justice system where despite much reference to coordination and partnership working, that's between London and Cardiff, there's far too much is done in silos and there is no overall approach to tackling the priorities and the needs of the people of Wales. There is very limited opportunity under the current scheme of devolution and the way that it is operated for a more coherent approach that uses resources more effectively and is specifically directed at the needs of Wales. I'll illustrate that 
Cathy's mentioned the way in which Wales was able to be a, sort of a, a groundbreaker in policy terms. But there are some big things which, if they could be done in Wales, would enable that to take giant leaps forward. But we can't because the legislative power is not here. Cathy's already mentioned one of them, raising the age of criminal responsibility. Scotland, it's higher than Wales. It would be interesting to compare Scotland and Wales. There are youth justice interventions which you can make within the criminal justice system in Scotland, which Wales would not be able to make because it lacks the powers to do so. And it is very clear that the message coming out of London is, once you're over the age of criminal responsibility, you are an offender first. It's, that seems to be the, the, the message that's coming out. So you, what you have then is this apolitical, unpolitical group of experts saying, justice needs to be devolved into Wales, to Wales. And the corollary of that is you have a Welsh justice system and you, you, you give the third leg to the stool, if you like. And this, was, this, this, was, this report came out in October 2019. The coronavirus pandemic happened within a few months. And the momentum which this could have given in formal terms sort of disappeared in a sense until the latest report of the Commission uh, on the Constitution chaired by Laura McAllister and Rowan Williams. One of the things that I have noticed following the, uh, the Thomas Commission is the Welsh Government, through its Council General, has actively tried to implement what it can of the Thomas Commission report unilaterally. So there has been um, a project to digitalise Welsh law, to codify it as well. Is that what you would be expecting the Welsh Government to do in advance of potentially having greater power in this area, even if falling short of devolution? Yes, and also when they're looking at the tribunal system, they are they are creating a, a look I'm going to legislate about getting a coherent system of, of, of justice within those areas which are entirely within their competence and creating effectively a Welsh jurisdiction about certain, about certain issues. There have also been some collaboration with the Ministry of Justice around, around certain things. The, 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 I think there was a bit of a wake-up call to the Ministry of Justice to do a bit more in cer certain um, ministers of state have been more um, attentive than others have been to to this issue, but you know, in terms of actually making the big move, you know, they have been powerless to do other than and call for it. Um, what's been interesting has been the way in which the um, Brown Commission, set up by uh, the Labour Party, has actually recommended doing some of it, which is devolving certain aspects, including youth justice sooner rather than later. Cathy, that's perfect teeing up from Emir. So as many of our listeners know, um, the, Gordon, the Gordon Brown Commission, uh, as part of its wider review of what the Labour Party might propose on in inverted commas, constitutional matters for the United Kingdom should it win the next general election, was relatively quiet on Wales. And part of the reason why we are recording today was in response to Think some some sort of muted response by the current shadow secretary of state for Wales, Joe Stevens, as opposed to committing to devolve youth justice and probation to explore such things. I, I suppose the question that I would ask you, Cathy, is uh, you know what counsel would you give to somebody exploring this issue, and do you see it being viable to devolve? parts of the justice system in this way, the, the probation system and youth justice system, would that correct some of those, um, oh, well, I'm going to use it anyway, I was trying not to go through the whole podcast and not say this, jagged edges of <laughs> devolution surrounding youth justice? I think it creates more, to be honest. Of, of course, I'm not go, ever going to argue against the devolution of, just, of, of youth justice and uh, by extension of probation. It would allow certain things that I think really must happen to happen. So, of course, the issue is a minimum major criminal responsibility. You know, at the moment, children of 10 can be prosecuted. And I think that, that there's so much evidence now, overwhelming evidence, that that is inappropriate. And the UNCRC, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, says this now says this should be no less than 14, which is indeed the world average now. 
So we're well behind the curve on that. And, um, and just to um, clarify for me, that's in England and Wales, not in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Is that correct? Northern Ireland is also 10 at the moment, but Scotland has just increased it to 12. So they they have taken that step and other jurisdictions around the world are also increasing their minimum age criminal responsibility. Uh, some of the states in, in Australia are looking at it at the moment because they're also 10 at the moment. So we've got a, a world movement to increase the minimum age criminal responsibility, but the Westminster government is not interested. And basically, that is their response, that they are not even going to look at it. So it's not going to happen unless we get devolution. But in order to make sense of that children's rights measure, we would have to do something about the about that, because otherwise you've got incongruence there. It doesn't measure up to the rights. So there are some things that I think would be massively improved and we would we would see a big difference. But of course, it doesn't then resolve the issue of the fact that both youth justice and probation, neither of those act unilaterally on their own they are all both they're both enmeshed in policing in the court system in the prison system and so those are our new jagged edges if you like that would open up as a result of doing this so um if the police uh, policing is not devolved then we can't address any of the issues that we know that there are with police. And I think at the moment we'd probably rather not be related to the Met and some you know, some of those issues that are going on at the moment. I think it would, you know, there are um, there are certainly things we could do differently. Uh, it may be easier to address things like the disproportionality issue that is just seems to be endemic through um, all aspects, really. Of, of the justice system. If courts are not devolved, then how can policy on the way we see sentencing and what should happen, how could that have a, a Welsh-centric approach? And that actually affects the rest of what happens. So it affects what happens in a youth offending situation with those children once they get certain disposals from court, is the, the, the context of that phrase. Uh, and with adults as well, if we have a, 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 a high, if the philosophy behind sentencing is English rather than Welsh, which is what it is, that permeates the whole system. So while I would always welcome this perhaps somewhat incremental approach as being better than nothing, I am concerned about these new jagged edges, I have to say. Oh, we've definitely run the jagged edge uh, buzzer uh, multiple times there. I'm, I was trying to hold off on that. I, it sounds like, and do correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, you, in some ways one might argue that the best solution is the sort of big bang approach. So you sort of mentioned, alluded to something like this, Emir, uh, in your previous answer. So do the whole thing. That is sort of what Carolyn Jones had modelled, uh, Carolyn Jones's government had modelled back in 2016. And it's something that could be proposed again. And, and you know, both of the, the current Welsh Labour leadership candidates, and one of them being a future First Minister, has stated that they are committed to the full devolution of justice and policing to complete that. I suppose with the questions that I would pose to that, are what would be the, the risks of doing that, you know, in terms of uh, ending this centuries-old connection? Or would there be any risk there? Would there be any, as a you know, practising lawyer, would there be any professional risks to that in terms of where you could operate. And I think I think also, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, is this something that's been done before? Is, is this even, would that even be remotely comparable, for example, to the situation with Northern Ireland? Well, it's always, it's always fools rush in where angels feel to shred <laughs> with anything to do with Northern Ireland, really. But um, certainly it happened in the case of Northern Ireland, the, um, the the single jurisdiction, the legal jurisdiction of Ireland was split into two um, uh, in, actually it was in advance of the um, independence of, 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 of Ireland and not, you know, it was part when everything was in flux there. Um, something similar has happened in Australia with the creation of a, of a jurisdiction for, uh, I think it was the capital territory with carved out of another one. But in a sense, does it matter whether it's been done before? Uh, the, the 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 issue is whether it needs to be done for Wales and how do we conceive of doing it. 
Um, and there are, of course, going to be practical issues. But there are some things which seem to me, at least, capable of being done relatively simply and which need to be done. And the first one is the recognition of Wales as a distinct territory from England. And also, by the way, there, as a consequence, a recognition of England for the first time as a distinct territory from Wales. That just makes everything so much simpler in terms of having a law of Wales and a law of England. You can avoid a lot of jagged edges there, a lot of uncertainty about what people can legislate about there. It's a separate question who actually makes the laws within those territories, whether the laws are made in Cardiff or whether the laws are made in London. But basically, you just say, the law that applies in Wales today, wherever that's been made, or it's been made in Cardiff, London, by judges through common law over the years, that today is the law of Wales, and in England is the law of England. Pretty straightforward. There would be issues around cross-border stuff and things like that, but these are quite manageable in, in legal terms. The next challenge would be, you put your finger on it, the professions. Well, most proposals, including the Thomas Commission, get over that quite simply by saying, well, any practitioner in England or Wales now will be a practitioner in both jurisdictions when this happens. It may be that you will need a special certificate to argue certain types of cases, as you already do in certain circumstances. Money is an obvious problem, right? Because with devolution of um, legislative and executive competence, you also need to make sure that you've got the resources which enable you to maintain a system. Now, you know, we can point at health and say, well, look, it happened in health. It happened in education. We've managed those things there. But I think it's fair to say that the justice system is slightly different in nature from both of those, particularly since both health and education were previously devolved but within the UK government to the Secretary of State for Wales, whereas Justice has never had that position. But those are practical issues. Um, the, the, so that, and that is the, the, the usual argument is it's going to cost too much, but nobody's actually costing it out, as far as I'm aware. The, the main argument um, that people put forward is because. Yeah? Well, because England and Wales, that's why we won't do it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it is so difficult and so intractable. Because if you like, if you want to think back, why should Wales have its own governance? Well, one of the main answers was because, because it's Wales. It was, a, it was a matter of principle and a matter of faith, which was beset with practical problems, right? Well, now, the article of faith now, as opposed to the, the rational explanation for why we should do it, the article of faith now um, hangs on England and Wales. And on, the, and the sacrosanct nature of that jurisdiction. Um, I think Robert Buckland's, you know, very genuine and very heartfelt, actually, plea to keep things as they were that we heard in response to the Commission on the Constitution's report was a, was a, was a very fine example of, you know, this is the best. Why would we want to lose the, the, the virtues and the wonderfulness of this, this single jurisdiction? And that's, and that's a, to my mind, at least one of the one of the big, the, the most difficult thing. If you can overcome that one, the rest of it will be pretty straightforward. I think it's also worth saying as well that the uh, Thomas Commission st said very specifically that it was just not viable to either retain the status quo or to have what what was described as unwinding devolution. And I think this is what we're seeing: is this unwinding devolution. And actually, perhaps that's just not a viable option, as they as they, they suggested in that report. Now, the Commission on the Constitution was was quite clear on this, that um, going back was not an option. Mm. And at, at the very least, the minimum was needed was, 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 was strengthening. And they also pointed to these incursions on the devolution settlement, which had taken place since, well, certainly since Brexit, but mm. and at least in part before then as well. Oh, gosh, imagine this. I'm, uh, as a layman, um, a, a sort of hardly the sharpest intellect in the world at that, I'm going to try and make a counterpoint to the last hour uh, or so of discussion. Uh, strap in, folks. This, 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 might, this might be a bump, bumpy ride. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, we had uh, Robert Buckland, uh, then former Justice Secretary and recently, um, recently knighted, I believe, Sir Robert Buckland on the podcast, 
If I remember correctly, his argument to us, because we asked him a question about justice uh, at the time, I know quite a practical conservative argument that one might expect um, him to make, which was it's working as at the moment. Um, the England and Wales justice system has shown that it can flex to accommodate you know, a, you know, a globally quite unusual circumstance of having two primary legislatures inside the same common law jurisdiction. The law is functioning well. Uh, the courts are functioning uh, equally well across uh, England and Wales. Why waste effort and time uh, going to this potentially disruptive measure now? And I wonder if that, in the court of public opinion, um, as well as perhaps other courts, might be a persuasive argument. What do you think? Could I just um, respond to that and say it strikes me that the there's another part to that. It's working for whom? So if you're looking at that from an English-centric point of view, it's working from for the English, but is it working for the Welsh? And I would suggest that because the Wales wants to do some things differently and is not able to, it's therefore not working for the Welsh. So if you ask the... Uh, the slave owner if slavery is working and say yes of course it is if you ask the slave whether it's working you get a very different opinion and I just think that perhaps it uh, depends on who you ask. I can already feel our comment section filling up after that analogy thank you very much Cathy. Um, <laughs> I, um, it's a, certainly an interesting perspective I I think I, I, I wonder if also there is a question I, I you know I, perhaps there's a nuance here Emir that um, I've missed but well, I remember around the debates of the 2016 Draft Wales Bill that the there was a change from describing the England-Wales jurisdiction as a shared jurisdiction, because if it was a shared jurisdiction, then there would have to be some kind of model by which both governments could equally share governance of that jurisdiction. And that certainly, uh, I think, it then became described as the joint jurisdiction, because there is no model of shared governance of it. Do you think that might be a way of, you know, if, if if the intention and the imperative is to keep the joint jurisdiction, some some way that the 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 two legislatures could share it more? Um, how 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 law is made in that space? I, I'm no. trying to I'm, I'm trying to find an argument. You see, no, no is the answer. Um, it's angels dancing on the tip of a pin. Unless it is clear who makes laws and who governs within the specific territory on a specific point and having the idea of both legislatures somehow or another um, doing it together doesn't work ultimately of course doctrine of parliamentary supremacy westminster can legislate in any event about anything that happens civil convention means it doesn't normally do so without the consent of the devolved parliament that needs to be enshrined in stronger ways than it is now but and so in theory it, it sort of could happen but it happens as an as a fight not not as a working together and i just i just can't see how it could happen and i think there's an there are some other answers as well to robert butland is it really working the delays in the court system miscarriages of justice police uh, allegations about the way in which the police um, as, as kathy has mentioned are, are despite the best endeavors of some wonderful officers are conducting themselves isn't isn't it the case that for example, legal aid is almost completely disappeared now. There are bits of Wales where you cannot get legal advice. Legal advice deserts. The same is true in bits of England, of course. Is the system actually working working well when you when you look at it? One could make that statement. But if one doesn't engage with the um, reality of the issues that arise, and in particular, the Thomas report, I would urge anybody just read the, the Thomas report if you've got the time, but the summary is good. Um, the, the issues and problems that are brought to light there by, I stress it, people who are not politicians, right? They need to be addressed. If, if you disagree with them, address them logically and rationally. Um, and that is what's been singularly missing. Nobody has actually come back and said, well, actually, the Thomas Commission is wrong about this. That is perhaps one of the most frustrating aspects of, of all of this, is that the discussion is taking part, taking place at a general principled level without an engagement with the informed engagement with, with the detail.
a sensible counsel to give to either incoming ministers in UK government or future Welsh government ministers or people with an interest in this about what the best, the optimal way forward here would be either in a specific area of youth justice um, or more generally about the sector in Wales um, and in relation to England and Wales. Um, do you, would you, Cathy, can I throw that to you first? What would be your ideal outcome here or what would be the best route map forward in your opinion? I suppose uh... I'm, you know, I'm, I'm. I would be happy for youth justice to be devolved. So I think we can do important things, but I think that that has to be the, the the start of a process, or maybe the continuation of a process that sees the other aspects of justice devolved as well. Because I just don't think that the youth justice system and the probation system are are standalone enough to be able to function in a in a properly devolved way, how we would want them to be. So I think that it, to achieve anything, we would have to just devolve the whole of the system. And I can't see any reasonable arguments against doing that, because I think we've shown innovation, ability, we've shown that actually that it would be very safe in, in Welsh hands. Uh, Emir? And so just don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of, of the idea that we could have a, a Welsh justice system. Don't fear it. It's, uh, and uh, if, if that fear goes away, then everything else, I think, falls into, falls into place. Um, I, I'm sorry, that's not a very, um, not a very programmatic adv piece of advice. But... May I ask um, just... Uh, sort of going looping back to where we first start about the the landscape of the United Kingdom, would I be right in thinking that it would bring a sort of degree of coherence to the wider union landscape? Because we at the moment we have a, a, a somewhat peculiar uh, England and Wales, England, comma Wales, comma Scotland, comma Northern Ireland in terms of where some of the laws are made about different places. Would it just be a coherent way of kind of normalising? The different institutions across the United Kingdom, or am I being, am I just seeking symmetry for the sake of symmetry? I think it would, I think it would bring about, um, or could bring about, greater symmetry, if that's the word you want to use, consistency between the ways in which the various, uh, which are called the devolved territories, um, are governed. Uh, it could make for less envy, perhaps. Um, but I think I think it will always be asymmetrical. We've seen with Northern Ireland the way in which three billion pounds is going to be given there. There'll, there'll always be elements of of, as, of asymmetry, um, and of course the, the, the complication for the UK is, you know, the, the F word, the federal UK. How do you actually do it? You can't. You know, is, it, is it possible to do it with England, Wales, England as a single unit of government on the same level? So. I think there is a, a bit of the sort of idiosyncrasy of of the UK, which is which, which you know you're just not going to be able to resolve in any neat way. Yes, absolutely. Well, what would future podcasts even talk about if we did? Um, <laughs> uh, I would just like to say thank you both uh, hugely uh, for your time. At this point in the podcast, we normally uh, ask our guests if our listeners have enjoyed listening to your thoughts and would like to find more of them uh, where should you point them um uh, kathy can i uh, invite you to suggest either a website or a social handle that you might be appropriate uh well i'm on twitter at at, at dr kathy hampson not okay. twitter sorry x <laughs> it's okay that's all right we still haven't adapted to that at our end either <laughs> um uh, and emir well, so am I. I'm also on Twitter on Emir, Emir Lewis 4. And, uh... I'm a, a wonderful follow, if I may add, um, not just for the legal comment. Um, occasional articles about the moon. Fascinating. Oh, yes, um, please, please. Yes, I'm Aberystwyth. Yeah, well, yeah, it's about Rwanda. Yes. Uh, I think um, it will link to the, the, uh, the article in question and some tremendous poetry at the same time. I mean, it's a, it's a multiple win, that one. Three legs well, on, that, on, that, on that stool, uh, on that yeah. Twitter follow. Um, uh, thank you very much to the two of you. And um, uh, if you have enjoyed listening to this podcast, um, you can find more from the Hiraith Pod team at Hiraith Pod. And uh, you can find us at uh, 
on that handle on most of the social platforms. We are also uh, have a website at walespolitics.com and if you're able to do so, please consider supporting our work at patreon.com slash hiraithpod. Thank you for listening to Hiraith. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review.